Greetings and salutations. This is Abe Abdelhadi with The Bitter Truth. We may not have all the answers, but we're going to ask an awful lot of questions. You can also become a bitter pill or a spoonful of sugar or the newly introduced tier of the medicine going down and get some fabulous swag to make your life better. We also have some really bitchin' t-shirts that are going to look great for you this summer. Uh, today, friend of the show, uh, guest uh, th- that I enjoy having on when he when he's able to make it with us, a gentleman named Miko Paled. You may know him from being the author of The General Son, Journey of an Israeli in Palestine. Also, Injustice, the story of the Holy Land Five, uh, the Holy Land Foundation Five. He's been on the show before to discuss that specific case. If you don't know about it, I highly recommend going back and listening to that. It's a, it's a lot of information, not just on the uh, Holy Land Foundation Five, but also the uh, situation that's been going on in the Israel-Palestine uh, dilemma for the last seventy odd years, if not longer. Um, Miko, how you doing, man? Doing great. Thanks. Good to see you again. Good to see you again, man. Um, hey, so, you know, we were emailing back and forth a little bit, and and this isn't like a big secret, but a lot of people aren't really aware. Uh, you know, we've we've had an over-militarized police force the last 20-odd years, especially since the advent of the NDAA in 1997. And, uh, you know, we have American police in big cities training in Israel, which kind of doesn't surprise me when I found this out a couple of years back because of the siege-like uh, mentality during Occupy, especially in Dapple. Um, what, what's been going on with that? And, and how many of our um, uh, city police forces are training in Israel? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me on the show again. Uh, it's great talking to you. Um, so I believe it was, um, well, let me, let me preface by saying there's a report on this issue, a great report that was put out by JVP um, called The Deadly Exchange. And I highly recommend uh, people go online and look at that report. It's got all the information, and JVP is also um, spearheading a campaign to end this deadly exchange uh, where police officers from the United States go to Israel to be trained by the Israeli police force, by the Israeli military, and by the Israeli secret police, the Shabak. And it's not just American police. It's... um, it's, um, Homeland Security, the FBI, excuse me, and um, and some of the other uh, law enforcement agencies. And this began, as far as I know, uh, after 9-11. And it goes back to this, you know, really, really deeply ingrained mythology that exists in America, that number one, there's this thing called Palestinian terrorism, and number two, that Israel is, has developed these brilliant system, this brilliant mechanism to fight that terrorism. And you build and build and build it, and it's really it's a house of cards because there's no such thing as Palestinian terrorism. And we can talk about why, and if, if you want, I can expand on that. Um, and Israel has never done anything except fight a people, the Palestinian people, uh, who have never had any resources, have never had a military force, I've never had as much as a tank or 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 a you know artillery brigade. I mean, not, nothing at all. So this is a lot of hype. But basically, based on that hype, we have this reality where I don't know how many, but I know that all the major police forces, and certainly some of the smaller ones, uh, go to train their officers, their police chiefs. They go to this. It's really an indoctrination. Um, and and a physical training, and I believe that was the, 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 the at least one of the organizations that's behind it and is sponsoring it is the infamous ADL, the Anti Defamation League, which pretends to be a civil rights organization uh, dealing with this you know civil rights in America, but really is a racist Zionist pro Israeli organization that is totally totally dedicated to the defamation of Arabs and Muslims in America. They had a hand in the, you mentioned the Holy Land Five, the Holy Land Foundation Five, my book, uh, Injustice. They had a big hand in making sure that these innocent men uh, end up in federal prison, which they still are, sadly. One of them has COVID. So again, I'm, I'm going off on tangents here if you want to touch back on that's those. Okay, that's okay, later. we'll get back there. Basically, that's, that's the background. That's the background. And again, I, I urge people to go and look at the Deadly Exchange report that the Jewish Voice for Peace put out. It's an excellent report, and it's got all the information. It's really quite shocking. Well, let me um, and just a and really just a quick side note. I'm sure you could do this in you know uh, a short amount of times. I want to jump. I want to jump into the the crux of of our conversation. 
But um, you mentioned earlier the fallacy of Palestinian terrorism. I know what you mean by that, but for our listener, can you kind of explain really quickly what, what you mean by that? Yeah. Um, like you said in the introduction, the, 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 uh, the issue, the problem, the conflict that exists in Palestine has been going on for the better part of, of the last 75 years, a little bit longer, actually, probably close to 100 years, but in terms of the existence of the state of Israel. And the, the, the short story, if you want to summarize it, mm-hmm. is basically European settlers coming to Palestine with this belief that it is their God-given right. Um, they expel enormous numbers of Palestinians initially um, in a process that began you know, 72 years ago and still goes on today. So Palestinians are continuously being expelled of their homes and their land taking over, destroying the Palestinian villages and towns and renaming them and turning them, and, 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 and turning them into Jewish-only uh, towns and, 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 uh, and cities and so forth. Um, so Palestinians, naturally, have been resisting this. They've been fighting, they've been writing, they've been campaigning uh, for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. They've been used a whole, they use a, a whole, the whole array of, um, of resistance, the forms of resistance that are available to them. A small portion of that has been armed resistance, a military resistance, which has been very small because, like I said earlier, Palestinians have never had a military force. They've never right. had the resources to build an army like, uh, like Israel has. Um, now, resistance to oppression, resistance to occupation, resistance to ethnic cleansing, um, which have, to which the Palestinians have been subjected, is all perfectly acceptable, morally right, and legally sanctioned under international law even with the use of arms. So Palestinians have done nothing outrageous, nothing wrong, and certainly you cannot uh, describe, you cannot characterize the Palestinian resistance as, as terrorism. I mean, you can, but it's false. It's not true. Right. You know, um, because the, 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 the purpose, the sole purpose of the Palestinian resistance has always been their liberation, their freedom, ending the, ending the occupation, allowing the refugees to return to their homes, things that have been sanctioned by international law and are perfectly acceptable and morally right. But because Israel gets to, is, is the conqueror, is, is the one winning this, you know, the so-called war, the so-called mm-hmm. conflict, they get to call the shots and they get to define the scope of the conflict and they are calling it a, a war against terrorism. So it wasn't invented here in America. Israel invented this, um, this term and Americans picked up on it. Um, but the, but again, that's the issue. The the, the 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 idea, the claim that Palestinian resistance, which is completely legitimate resistance, is terrorism is false. But it has become the narrative. It becomes the dominant narrative, and that's where we are today. Okay, okay. And, and I want I wanted you to do that. It's kind of a, um, and I appreciate you doing that. It's kind of a, like a run up to because I love the term the fallacy of terrorism because apparently Israel's been trading on this the superiority that they have that you know that they've got this licked which clearly they do not um but what what is it that they peddle to US police forces to have them come out and train in Israel Well again this is the myth this myth is so prevalent that it's a it's a pretty easy sell mm-hmm. and after 9/11 when this country was <clears throat> excuse me the the um, all, all, all the different branches of government in this country were were, panic, were, were panicking after 9/11, and they continue, I think, to act, with, you know, in in, in, a, in panic um, and hysteria, which costs people in Iraq and Afghanistan and other parts of the world, you know, a great deal because sure. American, might, sure. American violence has has uh, hurt all of them. Um, and so it was a pretty pretty easy sell to, to to go to the experts, and I and I hear this in in casual conversation all the time, when people hear that I'm an Israeli or from, you know, before they know where I stand and before they know what my views are and what I do, um, they assume that, you know, they can speak freely. And so they do speak freely and they talk about, hey, you guys, you know what you guys do to those Palestinians, but you guys, the way you fight those, that terror, you know, these terrorists, good for you. You got to wipe them, you know, wipe them off the face of the earth and all this nonsense. And my first inclination is to say, why don't you let's go to Gaza, take a look at these children. Right. This 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 cage in which Israel placed two million innocent Palestinians, more than half of which are children, uh, denying them water, denying them food, denying them medicine, bombing them on a regular basis, 
and, and depriving them of the basic most rights that human beings have. And let me see you bomb them and let's, let's see what you think. You know, look at the faces of these children. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, that's not part of the narrative. And so Israel can bomb Gaza and Israel can, can uh, bomb Lebanon and Israel can kill Palestinians on the street, right, left, left and center in every city in Palestine. And people say, oh, yeah, well, of course, they're fighting terrorism. What, what, what choice do they have? Well, they're not fighting terrorism. You know, they're not fighting terrorism. What Israel does is Israel, what Israel has done from the very beginning is amassed enormous amounts of military power, enormous amounts of military strength against a nation, a people that have never had as much as a, as a tank. Right. So right. you see the pictures, if you pay attention, you see the view, the pictures of the kid with a rock facing a tank. And that is the reality or, or a kid with a rock facing or a kid with a flag in most cases, not even a rock, you know, facing a, a, a platoon of snipers as we saw in Gaza sure. and so forth. Yeah. So that's the reality. The reality is that there's this country that built an enormous army, enormous military capabilities, enormous technology, military technology. In fact, they export, they make a lot of money by exporting their military technology um, against the people who've never had a military force. Um, and somehow they were so good at building this narrative, especially here in the United States, that people really believe that when they shot, shoot kids, they're fighting terrorism. Right, right. Um, and that's, you know, you listen to the news, you listen to, I mean, uh, any, any, almost every news outlet, that's the narrative, Israelis mm -hmm. are fighting terrorists. And most of the time you don't even hear about it. Because who cares if Israel just killed some disabled Palestinian kid in Jerusalem, the Israeli police shot here, sure. or they shot a medic in, in Gaza, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but that is the kind of narrative, that is what fuels the ability of Americans to say, you know what, we want our, we want our cops to go over there and learn. Now, the question number one is, why? Even if it was true that they're fighting terrorism, is there some issue of domestic terrorism here in America that is so widespread, that is so broad that we have to send all these cops over there and then I bring them back and put them in, and put them in armored uh, vehicles, militarize them, equip them like they're going out to fight a war. And who are they fighting? They're fighting civilians. people, who, civilians who are unarmed, right. who are completely unarmed and are disadvantaged in many other ways most of the time right. because they're black and brown. So this is the kind of, you know, America, white America loves this narrative because it, it fits in to the white American narrative in general. Mm -hmm. So they feel very, very comfortable in seeing their police chiefs going over there. And I know, not that I spoke to people directly, but through a third party, people who have spoken to police chiefs and to police officers who come back, and particularly <laughs> if these are people of color, and they come back just in, in, in shock at the indoctrination, at the racism that goes on, because that's really what it's all about. It's about racial profiling, and it's about, and it's about militarizing yourself and, and, and using enormous military force against a, a people who are not only civilians, but these are unarmed civilians. It's not even like it's, a, it's, a, it's an armed rebellion. These are unarmed civilians, both here and over there. Well, we made the chokehold illegal quite a while ago in this country, but um, specifically with the George uh, Floyd murder, that move that Derek Chauvin pulled, that's an IDF move, isn't it? Because I've seen that before on news footage. I've seen Israeli kids with, their, with a knee on their neck. I've seen, you know, civilians in, in uh, West Bank and Gaza with, a, with an Israeli soldier's knee on their neck, just like that. And then when George Floyd got killed, I saw all these cops come on, all these retired police force, uh, police officer guys come on, chiefs and whatever, on, on all these different news shows saying, oh, no, 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 that's illegal. What he did was illegal. Yeah, it's illegal. That move is illegal. But that knee move is taught in Israel, is it not? Well, you know what? I don't know that it's specifically taught because I don't think you have to teach a, 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 a racist killer to kill, <laughs> but certainly prevalent. It's really prevalent. Right. Okay. And you see these, like you said, you see these images of Palestinian children. Children, you know, that, that George Floyd, not that in any way, shape, or form his, his, his uh, cruel murder was, was any way... You know, but he was an adult. They do just to children. Sure. You see pictures, and I've seen, and I know, not just, you know, I go to Palestine a lot, so I, I don't need to see the pictures. I see the real thing very, very often. I mean, it's nothing. It's not even something that's, that's newsworthy to see a soldier, a fully armed soldier, with his knee on a kid's neck, on a 10, 12-year-old kid's neck. It's, it's nothing. You know, it's not even, if the kid dies, the kid dies. Nobody even cares. 
the kids, you know, these are Palestinians. So nobody, if, they, if, a kid, if, if they die, they, you know, it's, it's not something, it's not even newsworthy. Thankfully, here in the United States, finally, this uh, brutal, you know, murder of George Floyd was uh, was recorded and then and then shared, and the whole world saw it. But yeah, I mean, the tactics, and it's not, you know, what I think it's more than a tactic. It's not just the knee on the on the neck. It's the ability. It's this mentality that says you can put your knee on the human being's neck and mm -hmm. completely be and have no consideration for right. their well-being. You know what I mean? I think I don't know if that's taught, if that's some kind of indoctrination, if it's some kind of a, of a disease that, that is spread through, uh, you know, gen who knows? I mean, I can't imagine, I'm sure you can't imagine having a human being under your knee like that in, yeah. in such a, a painful, humiliating and, and, and lethal condition. I mean, who would do a thing like that? Yeah, no. So, I don't know what, you know, it's a chicken or the egg. Is it because they go to Israel and they, and they train by, by these people or because this is something they were doing anyway and this is just encouraging the racism and allowing for, for this, this you know, enormous brutality and racism to express itself. And again, in the case of George Floyd, and we see this in Palestine all the time, they don't care that there's a camera. No. He didn't care that he was being filmed. He did not try to hide it. He was. He did not care. The same thing in Palestine. I mean, when 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 these things happen, you know, the cameras everywhere. Everybody's got a phone. They don't care that they're being filmed. And in, and in in Palestine, at least, there are never any consequences. And here, we know very well that had it not been uh, posted and shared on social media, there would have been no consequences. For it would have gone without incident. It would have gone without incident, 100%. Um, well, and then it's, it, you kind of already answered this question, but, um, how, you know, and I think it's just because I saw some statistic a few years back that, you know, we, we lead in self-esteem and we lead in the amount of adults who believe in angels. Um, so you got a big religious bent toward Israel in this country, right? Even people couldn't even spell the word Bible. Um but why is it the U.S. taxpayer seems to have no problem backing this chronic human rights violator when the rest of the world seems to be aware of what's going on? And, and, and you know, tepid that it is, they condemn it, right? They condemn what's going on over there. But we seem to just, like you said, you, you know, you, you're told, you, told, you tell people that you're Israeli or whatever, and they get all, you know, they get all wet in the shorts and like, oh, my God, tell me about the to the And you're no dove. I mean, you know, you you had a military background. You come from a family. Right. You know, you're not like some peacenik guy who went to Harvard and got laid a little bit and smoked some pot and like, you know, found, you know, had to come to Jesus moment. No pun intended. You you were out in the desert, as it were. Right. And you you had your your moment where you realized this was all bullshit to begin with. Right. So yeah. you're not like some guy that, you know. You grew your hair to your navel and kind of chanted out in Sedona, Arizona for a while, playing a didgeridoo at a coffee house, screaming about butterflies. Wait, you... I wish I, no, I wish I had. God, I <laughs> well, missed, yeah, you and me both. both. <laughs> I missed out on. Dang, <laughs> yeah, like, you, you and me both, right? Yeah. I mean, but so, wow. so, so, where does this, where does this fetish come from? Because it's, 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 it's nearly a disease in this country. The, the fetishization. That, that that is such a good question. That is such a good question. That is like the key, the core. It's a question that's be that, that's asked all the time, and um, it's it's really important to understand this. And it's, by the way, it's not only in the United States. I mean, you look at Britain, France, Germany, all the major European uh, countries. They're all you know selling in weapons to Israel, buying weapons from Israel. Sure, they are involved heavily in supporting Israel economically. They do trade with Israel. In other words, they support Israel politically as well. Um, the difference is that over there, there is uh, the population is more educated, and the constituents do not want the support. But somehow, it hasn't reached a point where the politicians can actually are actually acting. So right. that's a difference between here and the United States. Here, the constituents are quite happy with this. Now, I uh, well, one of the things, one of the results of this, you know, the COVID nineteen and the fact that we're all staying home, is I've been hosting these panels on Zoom. And I did one on, uh, I did two actually, on, <clears throat> on the pro-Israeli group's intervention in American public schools. Mm. Now, I knew it existed, uh, but what I knew was mostly anecdotal. I mean, when my kids were in middle school, high school, I opened their social studies books. I read what was said about 
you know, the, 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 the Middle East, about Israel, ancient Israel. I was shocked. It was all biblical. There was no history there. And the politics was completely, completely um, wrong. Um, so we got to, we, we assembled a few educators, a few uh, people who were involved in policy, a few people who were actually teachers who had experience on the ground, and a couple of activists from groups in Virginia, the Virginia Coalition for Human Rights, and the Texas Coalition for Human Rights, who have actively been opposing these attempts. And what we found was, and again, people can go on my amicopella.com and, and, and listen to these panels, the, the amount of, of money that these pro-Israeli groups are investing, and manpower, and hours, uh, into making sure that social studies programs, social studies textbooks, portray anything that has to do with the Middle East, anything that has to do with Islam, anything that has to do with Arabs from an Israeli perspective. It all has a pro-Israeli slant and an anti-Arab, anti-Muslim slant. Wow. And it goes from, you know, a teacher who had a free Palestine sticker on his desk being fired to these enormous, well-funded uh, non-governmental organizations who exist throughout the country who go into the social studies conferences, which are big teacher conferences around the country each year, they go to they go state by state by state and examine their textbooks. And then whenever the state does overview of their textbooks, they participate and they demand changes. Wow. In Virginia, the coalition actually managed to block one of those attempts recently because they were well prepared and they knew this was coming. Mm -hmm. um, and they make sure that, you know, everything describes Israel as good. And I'm, you know, obviously I'm generalizing. So there's no such word as a settlement. It's a community. There's no such word as occupation, you know, I mean, all things like that. Sure. Sure. And whenever there has anything to do with, with, with violence, it's always Islamic uh, radicalism, Islamic terrorism, Arab terrorism, Palestinian, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That's how the Middle East, that's how basically the Middle East and the issue of Palestine is described. And if you go, if you talk about the ancient history, it's all out of the Bible. Right, right. You know, there is no, people are always shocked when I tell them, there is no historical evidence that there was a King David. Right. People just really drop down and want to faint when I say this. And I, to be honest, when I learned this, you know, I, at some point in my life, I was also, what? There was no King David? But how can you know our whole existence, our whole narrative is based on the fact that we are, we have come back because we are part of this legacy of King David. And there was no King David, or at least there's no historical, not a shred. Well, who's, uh, well this, this, is, this, is, this is like a, a bad joke, but who's buried in King David's tomb in Jerusalem? Is that like a random mummy they found? or, or There is bottom? no King David's tomb. Nobody knows where King David was buried. There's no oh, okay. I thought there was like a... There was, I, I, no. I, the only thing they ever found was King Herod's. And, they, and again, they're not 100% sure if it really was King Herod, but the assumption is that they found King Herod's tomb. Right. But, you know, King Herod was, was, was very... It's not King David, right? Right. So, so the thing is, the way this is taught... The way that going back to your original question, the way this is taught lends itself to uh, support, kind of an organic support for Israel and for the Israeli narrative. Because we learn it in middle school, then we learn it in high school, then if people go to church or synagogue, they learn it there again. It's it's you hear it in the news. Israel is a good guy. Israel is a good guy. Israel is a good guy. Israel is this and this and this. So by the time you become a cop and they say to you, you know what, you get to go to Israel and you're going to do, you're going to learn all their cool tactics about how they fight terrorism. You know, so you've got the education part of it. You've got the po political part of it. You've got all these groups like the ADL that I mentioned earlier, the anti defamation mm -hmm. League, this, this, this fake racist organization. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, the, the, the Israel has been investing in the Zionist movement, which created Israel. It's really the movement and the ideology that created Israel, have been investing endless, endless, endless amounts of money and, and effort in order to make sure that their narrative is, is the prevalent narrative in America. And they've been doing this for 100 years. They've been doing this long before the state of Israel was even established because they wanted to be sure that in America, support for Israel is goes across the board, is uh, nonpartisan or bipartisan, I should say, right, right. multipartisan, goes beyond religion, goes beyond anything. So now, of course, on top of that, you've got religious, um, <clears throat> all kinds of, an, of angel <clears throat> evangelical uh, Christ uh, Christians and churches that, that support Israel for their own reasons. But basically, they've invested and they continue to invest 
every moment, every day, every city, every state, every city council, you know, city council members are sent, are invited to junkets to, to see, you know, by the pros or other groups. Right. Their investment is at a very, very, very uh, basic level and goes all the way to the top. So that's why Americans have this, are so enamored by Israel, because they hear it over and over and over and over, and because they have managed to influence the education system, the public education, not the private education, sure, sure. the public education system, right. and, and the media, and of course, we know Hollywood and, and so forth. So this is the reality, and that's why Americans are so enamored um, by, uh, by, by the state of Israel. And I think they see it as as validating in a way because if the israelis are doing it and you know the americans did it to the natives and then they had slavery and then they went and bombed the hell out of you know they dropped nuclear bombs and committed all these horrendous crimes throughout their america's history well now israel is doing it so you know what then they're doing it against bad guys too and we did it against bad guys too so hey we have this bond um so that's that's how they do it that's how this this uh the americans are so enamored by this monstrosity well, and then, and you know, we have got a few minutes left. I mean, I, I think the I, I just finished a book by Daniel Immerwar called uh, "How to Hide an Empire," and uh, came out last year, I think. I saw him lecture on YouTube, and then I got the book, and it, it starts at the Spanish American War, and goes all the way to Trump, and it basically is it's pretty much every colonialism story that you know about what we have done. Um, you know, gets into experimentation we did on the Puerto Ricans, you know, just, just everything we've done, you know, the, 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 the Philippine war, which is, I've not read much of in my life. He gets into the Philippine war that we were in for the second longest war after Afghanistan. Right. And longer than Vietnam. And no, no one knows that we were there. Long. I thought it was a few years, but it turned out we were there for like 13 years through Taft. And so he gets into all these, these, uh, crimes against humanity that we committed all in the name of, of, you know, projecting the, you know, the manifest destiny and the American dream as it were. But the interesting thing about this is like when he gets into how we took Arizona and New Mexico and California and Texas from, from, uh, from Mexico, the idea was to go in and annex Mexico, but Congress put their foot down because there's not enough, there's not enough preponderance of white people in Mexico to justify it. Right. There's enough settlers. There, there's that word in New Mexico and, ter- and et cetera, Texas, but there wasn't enough white people in Mexico to justify taking Mexico, and it was going to be harder to, you know, to make Mexico part of America. But that was part of the conversation for a minute, and you're kind of going, "Wow, that's that's amazing." And and here we just we just take it for granted. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's uh, yeah, it's it's very true. I mean, this and this discourse actually still goes on here in America, a very racist kind of colonial discourse, and and and, and Israelis talk like this all the time. Israeli politicians, Israeli. Uh, Israelis on the street, the media, this is the conversation. I mean, they see no problem with, with what Israel is doing, erasing, eliminating, uh, annexing, no, uh, killing, denying people water on a regular basis. This is, this is a, this is, again, this is why there's such a deep, deep connection between the two countries. Well, and in, in, in wrapping up in these, these next couple of minutes here. Uh, so, so what are your thoughts um, moving forward? Because like, for example, I mean, Israel is racist. I mean, a couple of years back when, when Benny Gantz and, and uh, BB and all those guys were running for prime minister, there was this one chick, she used to be the attorney general. I think she was, well, she was like a really super hot, super modelly looking chick. And they did her campaign commercial, which was this black and white perfume looking commercial. And she's going down these spiral staircases and these pearls fall off and, you know, bounces and whatever. And then she, she seen putting this perfume on the back of her ear and this is in Hebrew. So I, I, I did, I it had, I had to see the subtitle, but the, um, the perfume was called fascism. And, and then she says in her, in her Hebrew accent, she said, but it smells like democracy. <laughs> and this was her campaign ad. This was what she was doing. And you're going, this made it, if an American politician did that on TV, they would be over. See, the thing is in, 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 the, in the election campaigns in the Israeli election campaigns, it's whoever is the farthest to the right wins. Mm. So um, to say, to, if you want, if you want to badmouth someone, you say that they're a lefty. So they call. So Ayelet Shaked, who you're describing, who was part of a real neo-fascist party called the Right Party, right as in you know right wing, um, uh, calls Netanyahu uh, a leftist in order to kind of you know put him down. And you go, this is this is how far 
Israeli politics have gone that these that somebody can come that's a Yahweh yeah, left. You know, the, the, the discourse is so incredibly racist. Um, the, the politics is so incredibly, I mean, these people are neo-fascist and they find no problem whatsoever in being fascist. They see no problem. And that, and that was a part of it. I mean, she's an idiot and this is a, it was a stupid, unbelievable, I remember when this ad came out, this campaign ad. Um, but it's all about running to the right and whoever is the furthest to the right, whoever hates Arabs the more, whoever justifies killing and displacing Palestinians more, uh, whoever can paint the picture as we have come to reclaim our land from these barbarians, barbarian Arabs who have taken over, wins. And that's exactly the makeup of the Israeli leadership. That's the makeup of the Israeli government. Wow. All right. So we got our, we got, we got, you know, a few more years of, of doing this work before it's over. Oh, yeah. Well, listen, I mean, Chris Edges has a great quote about that. You know, you don't fight fascism to win, you fight fascism to fight fascism, right? And so the idea is that, you know, have, have as much fun with it as you can because the idea is to piss these people off to the point where, you know, they're not going to necessarily give up, but they give in, you know, and, and eventually we've talked about this before. It is an apartheid state and eventually apartheid's fall. Right? <clears throat> so, but, um, well, hey, uh, Miko, thank you for your, thank you. Thank you again for your time. Uh, as always, man, it's, just, it's been too long, but it's been a blast to have you on as always. Um, Hey guys, in wrapping up, my guest has been Miko Paled. Uh, I'm going to have uh, links to his website and also the Deadly Exchange that he mentioned earlier. I'm going to put that on uh, the body of the show. And uh, again, patreon.com forward slash the bitter truth. You can get some stuff and support the show. And you can listen to us on iTunes and Spotify and everything else for free. And as always, if this stuff makes you uncomfortable, it's supposed to. Sleep tight. What?